Hello, everyone. My name is Melita Belgrave. I am an associate professor at Arizona State University, and I am the director of music therapy there. This is my 19th year as a music therapist, and it is my 10th year as a college professor. And I was excited when I was asked to share about research and why it's important to the field. And so I thought I would just take some time during this masterclass to share with you my research journey and the seeds that were planted in my undergraduate degree in music therapy, how that then transferred into my graduate degree, and then my research and how it has progressed and really been a journey um, across the 10 years that I've been a professor, and then how I use music therapy um, research to make sure that I have a seat at the table. Um, so I'll be talking about doing research and then how I use research to not just inform my clinical practice, but inform when I'm talking to others about the benefits of music therapy and why you need a music therapist. So let's jump in together. So as I said, I started my music therapy journey um, as an undergraduate student at Michigan State University. I'm from Chicago, and so it made sense to go to a university that was three hours away. And they had great football and basketball and marching band. And I was like, yes, got to go. Um, and during my junior or senior year, I took psychology of music, as many of us do. And there was a research project in there where you had to design your own research study. And that was when the seeds of research was planted. I loved going to the library and reading. In those days, you had to go by hand through the journals. Um, but I enjoyed reading the research, and I can still remember my study. It was on um, background music and reading comprehension, and I loved getting to read articles about that and then designing a study and then conducting the study and finding my results, and I really enjoyed all of it. Our professor helping us with SPSS, which I didn't know would really turn into something that I would come and have a love and hate relationship with, sometimes with SPSS. Um, and that was kind of where the spark started, just in that undergraduate course. And I went through internship, I worked for five years and then decided that I wanted to go back and get a master's degree in music therapy. And so that is when really thinking about being a researcher, in addition to reading the research, became a seed that was really planted for me. And I remember sitting in graduate classes and seeing people who had already done their thesis or people who were working on their dissertation and just thinking, I don't know if I can come up with something so smart <laughs> as what my colleagues are researching searching. I don't know what to do. And I remember having someone in the program who were several years ahead of me saying that, you know, they just did research that they were interested in that was based on their clinical work. And I thought, oh, maybe I could do that. And so while I was a master's student, I was working in hospice. And when I first started working in the hospice agency, I saw clients from all different ages, different diseases, different reasons for why they were enrolled in hospice services. And while I was in the master's program, I was also getting a certificate in aging studies. So I was doing a lot of focus on older adults from wellness through end of life care. And somehow magically, when I was finishing up the master's program and the aging certificate, Almost all of my hospice clients were older adults with dementia or Alzheimer's disease, and they were declining. And so I remember kind of being in those sessions, and I had originally had those clients when they were in the moderate stages, and they were able to be very engaged with me, and we could have conversations, and we could talk about music, and we could do so many different musical experiences. But I noticed as they were declining that the use of speech was declining, their ability to notice that I was even in their environment, even though I was kind of close to them, it, it had really changed. It had declined. It had decreased. And so as I started to do more literature review on Alzheimer's disease, I noticed that, oh, I can track kind of what stage they are in their progression. And as you get into the seventh stage of Alzheimer's disease, that your ability to sit up, your ability to engage with your environment and to have more than six words in your vocabulary, all of that has declined. <clears throat> and at the same time, I was taking a nonverbal class and I was learning about all these different types of touch. I thought, well, that's really interesting. And I remember I can never forget the day I was sitting in my clinical session um, with a patient and she just was not aware that I was there. And I, and I was playing guitar and I was sitting very close to her in this individual session in her room. But I thought, I'm 
think that I'm not really engaging her as much as I can. And so I took my guitar off, I put it on the on her bed, um, and I started continuing with acapella singing, but started to provide some touch on her knees and getting very close into her face into her face to let her know that I was there. And I noticed, oh, I'm starting to get a little bit more engagement behavior when I put the guitar down with my clients that are getting into the later stages of Alzheimer's disease. And so that is where my thesis came from. It came out of clinical work. It came out of me trying two different things to see if I could get a better response from my client. And then going back into the research literature and saying, okay, let me find everything that I can on touch, Alzheimer's disease, um, music, and non-music interventions. And so I did my thesis. I had um, a bunch of different clients that I engaged in that process. And what I found was that there were more alert states, meaning that the client was engaged in providing eye contact and engaging with me. Um, I looked at acapella singing, no touch. Acapella singing with instrumental touch was just touch related to tasks. And the research literature had really shown that older adults have a lot of task related touch when they're living in a facility. Like Mr. Jones, it's time to take your meds. Mrs. Smith, it's time for lunch or dinner here. Let me escort you to be grooming. Um, but we weren't finding that older adults had a lot of nurturing touch or expressive touch, meaning, you know, the kind that someone loved one, like holds your hand or puts a caressing hand hold to your shoulder. And so I designed the study to test those three conditions with music and found out that participants were more engaged, more alert if there was singing paired with some sort of touch and that the nurturing or comforting touch provided more engagement than just the task related touch. Let me help you play this instrument. And I remember one of my most exciting things was that I had seen a person for nine days in a row and I was doing these 30 minute sessions, 30 minutes to 45 minute sessions. And I was not really getting much response. It was just closed eyes in bed. And, um, on one of either the eighth or the ninth day with one of the touch, I got eyes open for just a little bit. And I got so excited because again, the research was based out of something that I was passionate about in my clinical work, which is how do you still provide music therapy services for individuals who are in the later stages who can't engage with you as quickly as they can when they are in the moderate stages. So it was so exciting to do the research project. And that's one of the things that we do, but we try not to like stop there. Then it's like, well, how are you going to disseminate what you found? How are you going to share that with other people? And so one of the things that was really exciting for me is then I put in for my first conference proposal. And so I did a presentation while I was still in the master's program, or I may have started the doctoral program by then, but I presented it passages and it was really exciting to talk to music therapy students about doing research and doing an in-depth research project. And then after that, I felt a little more confident and I put in a proposal for a concurrent session at national conference for AMTA. And it was great to talk with other clinicians who had been going through the same thing I had been doing, which is how do I reach my clients when they're not as engaged or it takes them longer to recognize them in the environment. And so to have that opportunity to share with others and answer questions or have validation from other clinicians who are doing similar things. That was great and starting to feel like a part of a network. Because sometimes when you're doing research, you can feel like you're in your own little silo um, doing your project that you care so much about that's looking at this really, really, really tiny thing in the whole, whole big landscape of the population or the interventions or your assessment measures that you're using, right? Um, and then after that, I decided to do a submission for the Journal of Music Therapy, and it got accepted after some revisions. So it was nice as a student, again, who had had that early seed as an undergraduate student to then kind of do something as a master's project that I had a lot of oversight, let's be real, from my major professor, but that it went from I'm doing something in my clinical setting, I wonder if I change this thing, what would happen? to reading the research literature, picking out the pieces that I need, running a study that was IRB approved, analyzing results, and then being able to not just take that information back into my clinical work, but to disseminate and feel like, oh, I'm contributing back to the field through presentations and um, getting to write up the article. So that was exciting. 
when I finished my master's work, I went straight into the PhD program. I did them back to back because I had already worked for a long time. And I, I knew I wasn't going to continue on with dementia and Alzheimer's. And at that time, I'd started doing some research with my major professor on intergenerational programming. And a lot of times when you say yes to being research assistant, that means that you read a lot of the articles. And so as I was reading the articles, I realized, oh, I always loved working with children. Actually, I started off my career working kids with special needs. And when I saw intergenerational programming, I realized I no longer had to choose between children and older adults. I could put them together and form um, an intergenerational programming using music therapy. And so for me, um, when I was doing a dissertation, it's a lot more in depth. So you are using research in different ways, very similar to how you do for a thesis, but even different. Um, because not only was I looking to find out anything about music therapy and intergenerational programming, I also had to look at just anything music in intergenerational programming. I had to look at older adults' benefits for these experiences. And I also had to look at young people. And young people could be anywhere from preschoolers all the way through college students. So, I mean, when you, I really had to look at the literature and understand it in depth and find out, okay, am I using this to build my theory about why I'm going to do music therapy? Am I using this to find out what type of interventions I should be using in my study design? Or am I going to pull it out to um, do my assessment measures? Maybe I'm going to do pre-test, post-test. Or am I going to measure every week? Or am I going to measure behaviors with um, some sort of video recording and then going back and tracking how behaviors are done. So I'm reading research when I'm doing a large scale study like that to pick out so many different things and then putting it back together to design my own study. And um, one of the things that I started doing after I was doing that research and moving forward and when I teach my students um, research class, I like to look at what has been done. So that's a great thing. I just kind of make notes either on the article or on a separate Word document, what's been done. What do I know about this topic? What do I still want to know about the topic and what is unknown? So the first two kind of go together. What has been done and what do I know? Those go together. And then what do I still want to know and what is unknown? And somewhere in that lovely space is usually where a good research question comes from or um, a really good research design. So I'm going to keep popping through. Um, one of the things that got really good with that, similar things. I got to disseminate by going to conferences, um, for writing up an article for JMT, which was fantastic. And then I also got to use parts of my dissertation to contribute to a textbook on um, the use of music therapy with geriatric population. So it was really neat to find all these ways that I get to contribute that I never thought would have happened, right? Um, the other thing that was really cool about um, the intergenerational study that was different from when I had done my thesis and probably different from any other one is that because you're looking at two different populations, there were so many assessment measures. And assessment is one of the other things that I love to talk about in music therapy. And just looking at the difference between standardized measures and informal measures and how could I use someone else's questions that they had used in a research survey and apply that to the study that I'm using. And so I got fascinated by all of that. I was in my advisor's office a lot saying, I want to use this measure. Now I want to use this measure. And I often got told from my committee that you have one too many measures, friend. <laughs> you can't have 10. Let's bring it down. Um, but it was, it got, again, when you start reading research and you start designing studies and you start analyzing your data and you start thinking, well, I would have done it differently, it usually leads to the next study, which is amazing and exciting. So after I left graduate school, I had my first job teaching at University of Missouri, Kansas City. And while I was there, I had a year long, every academic year, um, intergenerational rock ensemble. It started off with just older adults and then it expanded into being something with college students. Um, music therapy students would do it as part of their clinical practicum. And what was really neat about that was I was there all the time. I did it for six years. And so I really got the opportunity to think about long range research in a clinical site. And that was different for me than those one-time projects that I was doing related to my thesis or my dissertation or just to any other research project that I've continued to do in my career. 
And again, I like simple research. I like research that can inform my clinical practice and why I'm doing what I'm doing and how I can use that information to inform the clients why I'm doing what I'm doing, their family members why I'm doing what I'm doing, and my students that are coming with me into the clinical environment. Why am I doing it this way? Not just because I think this is the way to do it, but let me go and research some things. Um, so I had this older adult population that I worked with every year, every week um, across fall semester and spring semester. And so one of the exciting things that I thought about was I, in this intergenerational rock ensemble, I was always teaching new music. And sometimes the older adult participants wanted to know, well, why can't we do music that I like and that I know? And it said, well, it's great to do music that you've done already, but our brain likes new things. So let's Think about pushing the box and the envelope a little bit. I know you like music from the 50s, and we might do one of those songs from the 50s, but where I really want us to live is 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and 2000s in current. So we learned Mumford and Sons. We learned Taylor Swift. We did Shake It Off one year. It was hilarious. Um, but we also did Queen, and we did um, groups that were like rock groups that you just needed to know that they weren't used to. But in my early years, there was this push and pull between how far do I take you out of your musical comfort zone? So one year, I decided to do a research study on it. And um, I wanted to know what their idea, what their, if I could, inf basically I wanted to know if I could influence their preference based on exposure. So um, we don't always like new things, especially if we don't have a way to um, categorize it. So sometimes new music is so far off to the left, they can't categorize it for themselves. It's not similar to anything that they've heard before. So I did a simple study design. It was a pre-test, post-test survey. Um, I did like a seven point Likert scale. How much do you like this song? Do you know who the artist is? Do you know the name of the song and anything else that you want to tell me about the song? And we did this listening survey and map, listening to the songs, like 10 songs before 10 or 12 songs before the semester started, and then 10, 12 songs at the end of the semester. And songs ended up being categorized as low exposure, meaning we just listened to it like one or two times. Medium exposure, meaning we tried to work on the song, we listened to it a lot, um, but it maybe just didn't work for the choir, the ensemble that semester. And then high exposure is we listened to it a lot, we learned it, and we performed it. And the amazing thing was to see that, you know, their preferences for the songs, they were influenced by how much exposure you had to the song. And so then I thought, well, that's really great. What I thought was going on, I could use that back in future semesters. So when I would introduce a new song that they're like, mm, I don't know about this. I could say, remember when you thought Coldplay? Mm, I don't know about that. And Mumford and & Sons? Mm, I don't know about that. Trust me. Trust the process. You will eventually learn to maybe like the song. And if we get to week eight and it's not sounding well, I'm never going to put it on the concert and use it. So building that therapeutic relationship where the clients actually trusted me about the types of music that I was bringing in for them and that I would never put them on the stage and have them perform something that didn't sound well. It was just really great. Another thing that I noticed was that some of my clients, um, they, had a, they had a hard time singing in tune. And, um, you know, if you're going to put people on the stage, the, the music actually needs to sound good. We can't have, you know, 10 people sounding on key and five people sounding off key. We really want some blend in our rock ensemble. And so I got to use this piece of equipment called Smart Music. It's great. My music ed education faculty and colleagues had been using it for years. It was originally band software. And um, the music comes on the screen and you're wearing a headset and you play the part and you get this assessment report back and all the green notes mean you were accurate and if you have a red note it means you were inaccurate either with the rhythm or the pitch and you get an assessment score and so as a quantitative music therapist sometimes who's always looking for interesting ways to collect data I was like this could be fabulous how can I use this and so what's really amazing is that um, smart music you can upload any MIDI file into so I had a graduate student who was working with me on this project and we were looking at vocal ranges for older adults because we know that it changes for men and women. Men, their voices get higher. Women, their voices get lower. Um, but how does, what does that mean for arranging music and how do I do it? And so we built all these things into smart music. We built rehearsal tracks. Um, we built uh, Happy Birthday and My Country Tis of the Eats, uh, familiar songs. And then I got all this data back. 
And what I found is that I could categorize my choir as older adults who had a low vocal range, meaning they had like four to six semitones that they could get accurate those with a medium range and those with a high range. And the beautiful part about this is my older adults who I thought were just always a little out of tune and I couldn't figure out what to do with them, I could now start to make harmony parts that were of like one or two notes going up or down. And they were starting to have better success because it wasn't that they couldn't sing anything. It was just that they had such a small range of what they could be accurate in, right? So then they felt more successful. Um, and I could, and, and so it was just exciting for me. So again, I like to use research to inform what I'm doing clinically and just find out problems, like what's not working and how can I use research to figure that out? So those were some exciting things for me. Um, other things that I have done now that I've continued to move in my career is a lot of collaborative research. Um, and that actually has just kind of happened by accident. <laughs> um, I've either influ been influenced by an opportunity. So an opportunity that I can say yes to something, even if I don't know what I'm doing yet, or an I wonder statement. And one of the things that I wondered about, I was using music therapy and performance. I was using performance in music therapy. And I knew colleagues who had other intergenerational rock ensembles. And I knew colleagues who were doing rock band programs with um, adults and young adults with disabilities. But I wondered, like outside of my friend network and my social network, are there other people doing it? And how are they using it? And what theoretical frameworks are they using? And how are they addressing the treatment process across something that is performance-based, right? So how are clients referred? How are you assessing? How are you setting goals and objectives? How are you taking data collection? And what does termination look like in those settings? And so I sent a survey. I collaborated with a few music therapy students when I got to Arizona State who were interested in the topic. And we sent out a survey. We created this survey based on the research literature that had been done on performance in music therapy. And I was excited when I had 176 music therapists respond about how they use performance in their clinical settings. And what was amazing about it was then we had all this data to analyze. We put it in a poster and we got to um, present it at a poster session in 2017 at the national conference. And so just finding out a lot of things that again informs the way I teach about music therapy and performance, the way I continue to create performance ideas. So while I don't do intergenerational rock ensembles anymore, I do iPad bands. And so that influences the way that I structure my ensemble experiences for older adults and college students um, involved in those programmings. So it's really exciting. And a way that my career has grown and that I'm still doing intergenerational, but I'm putting different placements and spots based on what's going on in my clinical practice. Um, another like just, ooh, opportunity, I wonder what would happen, <laughs> say yes. When I was still in Kansas City, we um, had the opportunity that this children's group from another city was coming to perform in Kansas City and they wanted to do an intergenerational project with my ensemble. And I thought, that is great, let's do it. But as a music therapy researcher, I know that you can't just put two generations together and expect for anything meaningful to happen. It has to be structured that way. And it usually has to be structured over time. Most of the music therapy intergenerational projects that I do run from six weeks to 10 weeks. So this one time coming to the city, like what is that even gonna look like? And so the I wonder statement when I was working with the colleague who I collaborated with is, I wonder if we could use technology to foster intergenerational interactions. And so we're like, great, maybe we could get them to Skype during rehearsals. Well, we found out that rehearsals didn't happen at the same time of day or on the same day of the week. And so then we're like, well, how can we use video recordings? Can we send things virtually? And that became the whole project. And so we had virtual interactions before the children came to the Kansas City area. And then we had a day long workshop that our music therapy students read that were evidence based based on a lot of research that I had been doing on intergenerational programming, as well as others in the field. And then we ended with a culminating performance. And the most exciting thing about this is that older adults and young adults who participated in this project had the same cross-age benefits and changes in cross-age attitudes, meaning how you feel towards each other in interactions, that 
older adults and young people were having in six weeks to 10 week projects. So for me, I was like, whoa, this is blowing my mind on the way I can use technology in my own practice um, with intergenerational um, interactions. And in fact, this past spring, I did a class with my students where we went into the community and created this multi-generational project for six weeks. And we actually used a lot of technology for referring clients and for them to do um, self-referral to group assignments and how they decided what they wanted to do in the six-week project. So this idea of I use my research to answer some question or say yes to an opportunity for work that I'm doing. And then I take the results back. I disseminate information out into um, research poster sessions, oral sessions. And I almost always try to write up the article eventually and put it into a journal, either Journal of Music Therapy, Music Therapy Perspectives, or any of our affiliated journals that are national and international that music therapists present their information in. So my last few things that I wanted to talk to you about is just um, the other ways that I use research. So I like to do research a lot, which is fantastic. And I love it. And I love the collaborative experience that I get to do with it. Um, But the other thing is I use it to make sure I have a seat at the table because I like a seat at the table. I like to tell you what music therapists should be doing, what volunteer musicians aren't doing (laughs) that we can do as music therapists and to kind of put my way in there. And so I had this opportunity to get a research appointment at Mayo Clinic here in Arizona. And um, I'm working on a project that's heartbeats where we're recording heartbeats of palliative care patients. And then we are setting it to music and many music therapists around the country are doing this. And it's amazing. And it wasn't a project that I was really doing that much in my career. Um, But I was able to look at their study design and say, well, why don't we change the population of who we're going to engage in this and let's do a 30 minute, two hour music therapy session and let's collect some data after the music therapy session. So these were three additions because all that was originally going to be done was patients who were imminent, grab that heartbeat send it to me over at ASU and just have some recorded music go on top of it or having someone donate some music and then send the recording home to the family members as a bereavement gift and then do a survey. And I thought, wow, okay, that's, that's small. It's great. It's a great start. But let's look at all the other things that we can look at. So I'm in the middle of that project right now. And it's been so exciting to get to work with doctors and not just talk about what I can do as a music therapist. That's important. But what I can do as a researcher, how do I expand a research project that I'm brought into? So that's fantastic. Um, when I work at ASU, I get the opportunity to collaborate a lot. So we also have this grant going on that's been in existence before I got here. It's a music and memory project and it's community music project based with um, musicians from the Phoenix Symphony. And it's uh, sometimes music therapists work in the um, collaborative experience. And so what's great in that realm is that my hat is not as a music therapist, but my hat is as a researcher in talking about what are engagement behaviors for older adults with Alzheimer's disease when they are sitting in a group music experience, right? Um, So remembering that we wear multiple hats as a music therapist, as a clinician, as a researcher. Um, The other thing is that I not just only a seat at the table, but it allows you to have um, an ability to speak with authority, even when it's not your area of interest. So I had two opportunities this year that was um, really exciting, amazing, and scary all at the same time. (laughs) So the first one was we have a talk show here in Arizona called Good Morning Arizona. I love it. I watch it in the mornings when I'm getting ready for school, drinking my coffee. Um, And... I was like, wouldn't it be great if they had music therapists on Good Morning Arizona? Well, I got a phone call um, from our media um, representative at ASU, and they shared that Good Morning Arizona was already doing a study, not a study, but a morning show or morning clip on their show. They were doing a news feature on the use of music in classrooms for students with disabilities. And they just wanted to know what were the benefits. And so, again, that's where I started my research. And, of course, I teach on that. um, But that's not where my everyday clinical practice is all the time. And so being able to just read up on the latest research, making sure that I'm quoting 
facts related to our goals and objectives and what we do, uh, making sure just all of that information is in my head so that when I'm speaking, I'm speaking just as confidently on this other population as the one that I did my dissertation or my thesis or that I'm engaged in a research study on, right? And what was great, they came to campus, they did a session in my office, I got to talk about it, um, and it came on the air like two weeks later, and it was great to be able to contribute to something. Um, the other opportunity was US World News and Report. They were doing an article on music therapy and mental health. And um, during the interview, I had no idea which side of the coin they were on, on whether music therapy is beneficial or not. Just based on the way they were asking the questions, it was really intimidating. Um, and again, mental health is not where I practice right now, but it is where I have practiced before when I worked at the state hospital. So again, going back to the research, making sure you know exactly what the evidence is saying lately and up to date. And that is the one thing that even though I couldn't tell if they were like, yes, music therapy works or no, music therapy mm -mm, doesn't work, I knew that at least I had really informed myself in evidence-based practice and what the research is saying, where the holes are, and that I could speak confidently in that. And I think I was a little flustered on the um, <laughs> interview because I forgot to ask what the purpose of the interview was. And so it wasn't until the article actually came out that I realized it was for music therapy um, and that I didn't sound like an idiot <laughs> when I was um, giving my speech on what music therapy is and what it can do for mental health, right? So one of the things I just want you all to think about as we wind down the master class is just where do you want your music therapy research career to go? There are so many ways that you get to use it every day in your practice um, from practicum to internship to working as a clinician, to whether you decide to go back to graduate school and get even more honing in and research, knowing that there are all sorts of granting experiences um, when you are doing research. There's fabulous clinician-based grants from AMTA. There's the Fultz grants, which is the, woo, the really big one that we all want. Um, there's the NIH grants that are out there. Um, just being really encouraged to think about where you want your dream to be. And then the other thing that I forgot before I let you go, the other thing that I get to do is being a researcher is serving on review panels. So I am a, on the editorial board of Music Therapy Perspectives. And the great thing about that is you get to see the behind the scenes part of the submission process. So you also start to realize like, oh, that's why sometimes articles don't get accepted. I thought it was clear. It wasn't as clear as I thought it was. Or, oh, I'm surprised that my article ever got accepted, right? Um, but I, when I'm reading research and editing and giving feedback, all that does is enhance my own skills as a writer and as a research design Er, right. Um, the other thing that I had an opportunity to do is serve as an NIH um, guest reviewer on a panel. And again, sometimes it's hard to read something that's outside of your area of focus, but it's so exciting when you get to the other side of it and you're like, oh, I hadn't even been thinking about those things when I'm designing or, oh, here are these other measures that I never thought of or, oh, this is who I need to collaborate with when I'm doing a project. So all that to say, um, there's a space for everyone on the research um, continuum, regardless of what type of methodology you like to use. I do quantitative, I do qualitative, and I do mixed methods. I find it exciting. I do research designs that um, we look at things one time, we look at things pre-post-test, or I look at them multiple times across um, sessions. And again, my biggest thing is I just like to use research to inform my clinical practice, to answer questions that I'm curious about and then bring it back to the clinical practice. So thank you so much for listening. The 30 minutes has gone by pretty fast. Um, I hope you um, have some things to think about. Think about how research can be used um, in your own journey. Think about doing studies. Think about submitting poster sessions and just being engaged as a clinician and as a researcher. Thanks so much. That's the end of my time. Have a great rest of your day.